So we will start by introducing the panelists and then discuss the projects that they're doing and, and finally uh, try to answer some questions. Um, one thing that I want to emphasize about the, first of all, the objective of the panel is to discuss what I would describe is the state of the art case studies around traceability, inventory management and sustainable manufacturing. And one thing that I want to um, remind everybody as there's a lot of, of traceability uh, blockchain projects out there, the common theme of all the projects we are talking about is two common things. One, they are utilizing the power of tokenization in order to track and trace, not just notarizing uh, common transactions or common basis of truth on a blockchain. And the second thing, all of them have the understanding uh, that eventually in order to succeed and, and to scale, uh, they need to go public and therefore they're high, uh, uh, either in hybrid state, meaning sharing, sharing some of the information publicly and some inf information privately or uh, private, but being built in order to go public. So I, I would say that these are the, the two main themes that, that make these projects unique and different. And, and with that, I want to um, go directly to, to introducing our panelists and, and I'll start uh, with Gianluca. Gianluca, please. And I'm Gianluca Tesolin. I've been working in Bofors, Italia since 1993. This means that are 27 years that I work for the same company. Now I'm the CEO of the Bofors. Bofors is a company working in the food sector a leader in the door to door uh, sales of frozen food and ice cream. Bofros is a German group and uh, based in, in Germany and uh, with the 1.2 million billion euro turnover, 4 million customers and uh, uh, more than 10,000 employees. Uh, Italy is the second market uh, in Europe and uh, we have uh, 240 million, uh, 1 million turnover and 1, mi 1 million uh, customer and 2,400 employees. We are in the direct sell market uh, and in this market the, the real strength is the personal relationship between salesmen and the customer. You think that uh, uh, our salesmen enter in the house of the customer more than 24 times per year. The service now is really appreciated also in this period as with the coronavirus period. Uh, that you mean that uh, you imagine that in the last two months, March and April, we are increasing our turnover more than 60 percent. But the, in the last uh, the, in the last years, occurred some change from the social point of view that had a big impact also in our business. Uh, the new customer is completely different for the, uh, in, from the old customer. He pay more attention to the sustainability, the environment, the traceability, the origin, and the animal welfare in the level. But also the salesman is completely different. He is uh, more digital, but he has no talent for the social relation and uh, he needs support for the technology to be prepared when he visit the customer. Bofrost is also reliable for a, a quality point of view. We are considered in, uh, in Italy, in Europe, as a court, as a tribunal of frozen food. Imagine that we make more than 1 million quality checks of product every year. This means that it become necessary to highlight more than in the past our big attention to the product in the, product, the production processes. And therefore, we decide to start with a blockchain project with uh, Ernest Young. Thank you. Perfect, thank you. And, and I think that, that one thing that, that I take out of this uh, introduction and I wanna touch upon uh, uh, during this discussion is, is the, the changing customer expectations and and also the salesman is is a very important aspect of things and but but especially regarding to customers we will definitely touch on this point in uh, as we continue uh, let's let's continue with the introduction shannon can you please go next sure hi i'm shannon peterson i'm with corteva agroscience um corteva is a pure play ag company 
um, really with the three pillars of our company, um, mainly um, seed technologies, crop protection technologies, and digital technologies that we offer to our customers who are largely um, farmers and growers. Um, so our, our use case um, around blockchain is really um, on the seed side initially and um, looking at ways to expand um, and grow our initial um, product launches to our, to our customers who are farmers, right, who need those technologies. Um, a, technolo a new technology may be approved in a, in a certain market like the U.S., but not approved globally or approved mainly globally but for, say, for one or two countries. And in the grain industry, um, being able to effectively manage those new technologies to make sure that they stay in the countries where they're approved is largely today a uh, uh, heavy manual boots on the ground effort. And so exploring blockchain um, to be able to expand the launch of those new technologies and approved markets um, is really important to our customers. So uh, thank you for that. And we will again uh, touch back on, on, on what the project is doing later. Uh, just as uh, for the introduction part, Ellen, can I please ask you to go next? Yes, hi. Uh, so we're an uh, industry cluster for the Norwegian fashion industry. And uh, as uh, most of uh, us are aware of the fashion and textile industry has faced scrutiny for a long time as one of the most polluting industries we have. So, and the revelation of social, of the social consequences of the global supply chain, such as unbearable working conditions and uh, environmental consequences, consequences such as water consumption and the amount of chemicals that are used and released uh, from the industry has also been uh, been a source of, has left the consumer um, wary about the information released from uh, our industry so for a long time transparency and the push for being more transparent has been a means to push the industry in the right direction and uh, not only uh, due to the consuming consumer having a right to know where their products are made uh, and and they are made in a way that they can support, but also the fact that when you are demanded to show and tell about your uh, the way you do business, you tend to make choices that also can be seen as a brand. And lastly, we see it uh, on the policymakers' agenda and increasingly uh, to demand verified information from the industry. So our project was initiated to assess the possibility to apply blockchain technology to verify sustainability related indicators such as water use, carbon emission, labor wage levels uh, and chemical use uh, to provide the, the traceability that is demanded from the fashion supply chain. Perfect. Thank you. So, so first of all, again, we, we will. I, I will come back to the point of why do this. Uh, so, why do this means first of all, is the customer expectation changing? We'll we'll ask that later. And and then the following question would be, uh, even if it's changing, why use blockchain? And 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 I'll come back to that point. But. Touching upon sustainability is exactly the point where I'll ask our, our next panelist to, to uh, weigh in, uh, uh, Rob Opp from the UNDP, please. Hi there. Um, hi, Chen, and hi, everybody. My name is Robert Opp. I'm the Chief Digital Officer of the United Nations Development Program. And UNDP is uh, the development arm of the UN. Um, we have a presence in 170 countries worldwide. Our mandate is poverty reduction, but we work across lots of different areas like climate change, uh, governance, uh, renewable energy, poverty reduction, and others. Um, so we are looking at the issue of supply, uh, sustainable uh, supply chains in very much the same way as some of the other speakers are, um, but we see ourselves as a large international public sector organization in occupying a special place that, with a very large footprint where we can try to bring together different parties, um, both from a kind of a country, a multiple country level, as well as uh, multiple industries and players in the industries. And I'm 
I'm happy to talk more about that, Chen, when you come back to me on the, the work we're doing. Perfect. And, and last, but certainly, certainly not, not least, Professor Mary Lassity. Uh, give us the, the academia view of all of this. Okay. Well, he hello, everybody. So um, it's a great pleasure to be here. What a fantastic event. To, so congratulations to E&Y. So Chen mentioned I'm a professor, but I'm also the director of the Blockchain Center of Excellence here at the University of Arkansas in the Sam Walton College of Business. And we really have a vision to help educate and to help um, enterprises along with their adoption journeys for um, blockchain enabled solutions. Is that all you want me to say for now? So this is just the introduction, for now, right? For now, yeah, yeah, for now, I think, yes, it's just the introduction. And, and uh, next, I, I want each of you to, to really describe a little bit of the project uh, that you're doing, what you're doing, uh, what is the motivation, talk about the ROI. So um, I'm not interested right now at the technology, if we have time, we will touch upon it. What is the motivation behind uh, investing the, the, uh, the considerable resources in order to do this. Uh, and and um, let's start with uh, Gianluca, please. You, you started to talk about it a little bit in the introduction, but let's hear more about how you see uh, a, a, a client expectation change and also uh, your Salesforce expectation change, please. Uh, the project uh, is based on the possibility to implement uh, uh, the tracking and the certification of data related to the frozen food supply chain in the various phases, phases including the cold chain or two both first uh, best seller product. We chose uh, one Italian product, uh, vegetable, with uh, 60 different suppliers in the three regions, uh, growing in three regions in Italy. Uh, the artichoke uh, supply chain. The other uh, is another product from foreign uh, supplier, Nordic uh, code fish. Uh, there is, uh, uh, here is important uh, to show where the code is fished, the boat, the production plant, and the logistic process. Um, providing evidence on why we say that our fish, our product is fresh and then fresh. We selected AY as a partner uh, in the research in the development process for the use of the blockchain technology through an advanced process for the creation of a dedicated blockchain for, for frozen food platform. Uh, the solution implemented, implemented for the tracking of production chain and the certification of all process represent a concrete application of the use of blockchain technology in support of quality and the transparency and the authenticity of the product. The first phase was a preliminary phase for uh, concerning research, study, and development activities uh, for the realiza realization of uh, one integrated system and the creation of a coverage deck with related reports. Uh, during the second phase, we did a functionality, functional analysis variation data notarization of the production process from the selection of the information to be transferred through the QR code to the data notarization and the implementation of the landing page for the final customer. At the end, we can say that uh, now our customer will have access to all the information regarding the product purchased as a fishing date, carry plate or packaging. Now, it's possible also to make storytelling, education, social sharing, and gamification. The last phase was concerned by operational management uh, on the blockchain solution, including analysis of the customer data. Uh, now we can say that we had uh, thousands of customers that through the QR code had access, had, have, had, have had access to all the information, of course, uh, uh, we analyzed that are mainly uh, living in the city, in the big city in Italy, uh, Milano, Roma, uh, Genoa, and, uh, and they are uh, young family. And uh, they correspond exactly uh, to our target. Uh, we improve our image in the market, 
uh, becoming ever modern and reliable company. What is the next steps uh, will be to scale these uh, in uh, this project applying to the other more complex product. Complex uh, this means with more ingredients. Uh, the, the, our idea is to start with the uh, pizza margarita project. Uh, the pizza margarita has uh, more or less seven ingredients. And uh, now it's uh, interesting to see uh, what happened and the vertical, it will be interesting to see what, uh, to see how this integration will change the, the relation with also with the various uh, stakeholders. So, so thank you for that. And I, I think one thing that we've seen, uh, you know, Italy has been a lot in the news uh, in regards to COVID lately, but um, in the last two, three years, I think that we've seen another thing come out of Italy as a front runner for the world. Um, the fact that Italians place uh, food in, in such an important place and the ingredients they put in their food in such an important place make Italy really a world leader. In, in track and trace of, of food uh, components. Um, and, and we see this all across the board in, in the great innovation that, coming, uh, that comes out of Italy in that sense. Uh, and definitely thank you for that. And, and, and of course, uh, speaking from another, another um, heavily COVID infected area in New Jersey, uh, um, our hearts are, are with the Italian people at, at these times. So uh, uh, let, let's move on and, and uh, Shannon, I I'll ask you to describe yeah. the motivations behind your project because I know they are very different uh, in terms of, of it's not about the just the end consumer uh, traceability. So uh, if you can say a few words about the motivations behind uh, the uh, product uh, traceability and the, the, the C traceability project. Sure, absolutely. So, so when we bring new technologies to the market, um, there's a global approval process that goes on and it can take years. And so for those uh, farmers and customers in, in a market that's already approved, um, their access to those next the new technologies can be really limited. And um, the why around this for us is, is really being able to um, have that immutable traceability around those technologies so that we can offer them in those improved markets, perhaps years earlier um, than we would have, you know, for for us as an organization, right? That's that's several years worth of revenue um, that we're generating early, and for our customers, these are technologies that they're relying on, maybe because because of some new pressure in their industry, like insect or disease, right? They're they're waiting on these new technologies to ensure their profitability, and so because. Um, these technologies, if they're not globally approved, um, the grain channel, um, making sure that they don't get in the grain channel and get into a market where they aren't yet approved, um, like I said before, is a very uh, largely manual effort. And we may, um, if we do launch an approved market, we may only segregate to a small number of customers whose end use is maybe feeding to livestock. So we ensure it isn't going into um, into the grain channel. And so that's really the motivation for us to be moving forward with this type of technology. Right, so, so, so what I take out of this and also from the, from the uh, previous uh, discussion is that when we do this, this is not about a cost reduction play or an efficiency play, not just about that. We are talking about uh, ways blockchain technology can increase revenue and open new business models. And I think that this is a very important emphasis. And, and you know, when, when um, I'm asked, why would organizations invest so much money in this? That's the answer. New ways to create ROI and new ways to create revenue in, in, in business models that are not possible with, with current uh, day's technology. Ellen, I, I want to turn to you and, and again uh, uh, ask the same question. How do you see uh, the end customer uh, uh, as part of your project? What is the motivation? What is the vision? Uh, how do you see ROI? Please. Well, uh, first of all, I think that the 
core mo motivation for, for our project and brands was uh, to find a system to be able to, to show both the sustainable efforts that are done, but also be able to, to provide the, the transparency that the consumer increasingly are demanded. But I will, so, so it's, it's both like for the brand to, to be able to measure itself uh, and, uh, and work uh, with their producers and, and back uh, towards the value, through the value chain. But also I think that we see that consumers are becoming increasingly more educated of what is acceptable and, and who they would like to support by buying their project, uh, products. So therefore, I think that uh, one core like lesson for a take back from the project is, is also the way that brands use this information to communicate towards the consumer can be a really real return of uh, investment due to kind of me making sure that the, the sustainable, uh, sustainable efforts they make can make, be a true uh, game changer. So, so the, the question is, you know, I, I have this question all the time. Do you see customers pay more for, for sustainable product or do you see them prefer a, a, a brand that proves sustainability over a brand that doesn't? Where, where do you see that, especially in, in fashion that interests me? Yeah, well, we're, as we're located in Norway, I can say something about the, the numbers here. We've done uh, quite a few uh, uh, research project, projects on that topic and we see that it's uh, increasing uh, steadily over the past few years, especially uh, we see that high educated, uh, highly educated uh, city or people around, around bigger cities tend to be more invested in, in uh, uh, sustainable uh, brands, but that is uh, probably, uh, um, yeah. Uh, but we see it's an increasing, uh, especially uh, or globally, and we also see that they're asking for more information. So, so uh, uh, you know that that's interesting because this is already a common thread also between you and Gianluca, who who said the same thing. The young and the and the ones that are mainly uh, located in the cities and that are more comfortable with technology uh, expect this more and more. And and as the buying power of uh, the Z generation increases and increases, we definitely see. Um, uh, th th this becoming more and more relevant uh, and, and this is why we're investing so much in this area and this technology. Uh, Rob, I'll ask you uh, to connect this to uh, sustainable manufacturing, but from the other side. If we spoke about the Norwegian countries or the Ita Italy where the buying power uh, exists, how do you see it from the developing countries side? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I mentioned UN, UNDP is the development arm of the UN, and uh, our starting point is always the 17 sustainable development goals, but also just the very human fact that 700 million people are still living in extreme poverty, and a surprising number of those people are the ones that are producing the uh, food and luxury goods and things that end up on our in our houses and on our tables. So our starting point is what can we do to change the market conditions to incentivize uh, consumers or uh, other parts of the value chain to deliver more value or share more value back with the people who are actually at the production side? And so what we've been experimenting with is, is really um, how to address this issue with a, a traceable supply chain. So having that increased transparency that on the one hand, consumers, just like Ellen just mentioned, consumers are expressing an interest, particularly younger ones, they're highly educated, they're expressing an interest in knowing more about provenance and sustainability of the goods that they're buying. And on the other side, we wanna make sure that we're able to give the assurance and provenance of sustainability. So as an organization that's present in 170 countries and dealing with issues of poverty uh, reduction, we are trying to see where we can create that bridge. And so we've started in, uh, Ecuador uh, uh, with with cocoa production so small small cocoa producers that are producing um, cocoa that's bought for chocolate and made into chocolate bars for the consumer market 
And we we set up essentially a test project that way to see if using a sustainable uh, or rather a, a blockchain traceable platform that would actually link the production all the way to the consumer level would incentivize a higher price or a premium that consumers would pay. Um, and so far that's been uh, successful in the limited um, space that we've, we've used it. But we're already thinking now about how to build a globally relevant platform that would be a multi-party platform that could accommodate multiple producers and producers associations in different countries that would be using different commodities and give a kind of a, a digital public good that would allow then the uh, buying the, the companies who are buying those commodities to have the assurance and the visibility all the way back to the production level. And we see this as a network of partnerships, of course. There's a lot of supply chains and things um, like supply chain provenance type projects that are out there now. We see them as quite fragmented and we want to see whether we can start to bring some of those together so that there's a sort of um, really a, a kind of a movement around that that really can work across these different commodity lines in different countries uh, that are really, you know, in really as a means to give and share the value back to those who are producing the goods. Right, so two things. First of all, I, I would come back to you later with the question of um, the why public or why not private? You know, uh, we've discussed this and, and I know uh, the views there. That's one thing. And, and the second thing I wanna show is this is the chocolate bar you're talking about. I, I kept one and <laughs> just so the audience sees, right? This is this QR code is a, an ERC721 token. Scanning this code would consume the uh, chocolate bar and, and uh, would report back on the consumption. I don't have a wine bottle here with me, but works in very much the same way. And, and again, comes back to the uh, power of Utiliz of utilizing tokenization in order to track and trace goods. Uh, Mary, as someone who is very conveniently located in one of the uh, <laughs> uh, innovative uh, regions in the US uh, around track and trace, uh, uh, sitting very close to Walmart, uh, doing it, you know, the way we see it, um, uh, wrong in the sense of not tokenizing and not uh, uh, putting it on public, but still nonetheless uh, um, uh, working on food track and trace. What do you see from, from, from the uh, Arkansas area? Okay, well, well, first I'm gonna talk a little bit broader than that, Chen. Please, please, sure, absolutely. One, one of the th I just love this panel because I think out of all the panels we've had so far, this is the panel that's discussing the opportunities for not just business value, but for social value. So I, I think it's, it comes so clear. I also think that supply chains are one of the easiest things to explain and sell to a C-suite, right? I mean, the vision is simple, mind to finger, you know, farm to fork, bait to plate. I mean, they understand intuitively what you can get with that. I also think supply chains are easier because you don't have to have the financial part in here, right? So you can have the tokenization and the first step can be tracing your assets from, from source or commissioning to decommissioning. So to me, this whole area has tremendous opportunities. It's the easier sell in my mind to the C-suite. And you begin with tokenization and you may not be necessarily transacting the, the, um, the values or smart contracts that's moving money as an, at least as an initial first pass. Okay, so that's one thing. <laughs> Then, then the I, other I, can I can I intervene? Wait, sure, wait, wait. Ahead, one one ahead. thing I have to intervene. Uh, uh, <laughs> eventually, the idea of the way we see blockchain, uh, the eventually the idea is to manage the exchange of values. So maybe, as you said, we start with supply chain, but if we do not reach a situation where we manage the exchange of value, meaning tokenized goods against tokenized dollars we are missing a lot of the power behind blockchain. Um, please go ahead. No, no you're Second absolutely point. right. So I, I think one of, the, one of my messages is that EY, you guys, are, you're such visionaries and you're almost like leapfrogging. But we study a lot of enterprise blockchains and they're not, they're not ready to leap with you yet. 
So most of what we're seeing, you, you were asking me to, to comment on kind of the state of where we are, is I'm still seeing most of the supply chains being done on private permission blockchains. Um, they, you know, they're, they're going to be taking baby steps initially. We're not seeing interoperability. We're really sort of seeing um, blockchain islands. So uh, Gianluca is talking about, you know, farm to fork, and, and we also have um, Ellen, but there's lots of food traceability platforms out there that are blockchain enabled. So we're right now seeing a proliferation of solutions that are typically around a couple of consortia partners. Um, and eventually we're either gonna end up with co consolidation or migration or interoperability. So I love the EY vision, but so it's a struggle for enterprises to keep up with you guys. <laughs> so uh, we're seeing more incremental sustaining innovations. We're definitely not seeing disruptive innovations where they're getting rid of intermediaries and middlemen. It's really about kind of, can we come together in the spirit of rising tides raise all ships and uh, in order to get end-to-end -end vis visibility? So th thank you for that, and and I I do appreciate the um, you know the the the, the remark about uh, organizations are are not ready. Um, I think that this is something that that we will lead the market on, and and you know I had a a discussion with Paul about this. What what. Was the market ready for, for touch, uh, uh, screen touch phones like the iPhone before it was launched? Uh, very good question. When it, would when it was launched, we know all the results and, and we strongly believe that, that we can leapfrog this, uh, this part of the, of the technology at least. Um, my next question would be, um, you know what, I, I want to continue to touch on this, on this point. So, so what you said about, um, you know, organizations working currently on private blockchains. Rob, I want to come back to you and really, and then, and then I will also uh, ask Shannon the same question. As we are all aiming for a very large ecosystem, Rob, how do you see a private versus blockchain in that sense? Pr private versus public, sorry. Yeah, and you know, I, I think public just has to be our ultimate vision. And uh, quite frankly, I want to thank you, Jen, um, uh, as well for for your support in in helping us think through this. Because you know, if we were to create uh, just a private chain and and then just try to convince one by one um, some others to participate, I don't think it's going to get us where we need to go. We we really need to have that openness that this is uh, a digital public good, um, essentially. And so. It absolutely, the, the key to this is that we would get collaboration from industry partners in particular who are interested in purchasing uh, some of the commodities that are being traced by, and, and the provenance traced back to sustainable uh, development um, or sustainable production, I should say, um, that are being traced through this platform and they're willing to come together so that this is not about, um, uh, you know, that the ultimate competitive is competitiveness is going to become out of that collaboration as opposed to trying to keep it a closed shop with just a few partners. Um, so really, uh, you know, it, it, we, in, from a technology point of view, we've talked about this, you know, we might need to pilot something in a private mode or something like that, uh, but that's just an interim step to the ultimate vision. Right. And, and Shannon, same question to you as, as, you know, eventually if, 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 Corteva's vision uh, comes through in that regard. You are talking about a huge ecosystem of farmers, not people running ERP systems. And, and, and this is where, you know, the, the public versus private really uh, uh, takes an interesting twist. So, so what are your views on that? Uh, yes, absolutely. I think that's, you know, that's an evolution that will need to come. I think you know, in our MVP one use case, um, probably is not the driver of that evolution. But when you think about the the farm to fork um, transparency that the end consumer is looking for, and when you talk about sustainability and um, you know, the value that that can add, um, it, it, almost as a commodity, if you think about it, um, you know, farmers by nature. Um, 
use sustainable practices because it's you know it's vital to their operation. Um, it's vital to their profitability and their care for the land and in in their families. And so that's a story that's not well told um, yet and understood outside of the ag industry. And so I think that that those type of uh, sustainable practices and telling that story as a part of the farm farm to table, farm to fork, however you want to call it, picture, right, is, will be a key driver in, in moving this whole, um, whole thing forward in a public uh, manner. So, so I want to I wanna answer that and I want to relate to a question I see in the Q&A that, that uh, really, really intrigues me. The question says, well, you didn't answer, all of this is great, but you didn't answer why blockchain and why not do it with a centralized service? And I will start with my answer to this, but, but then uh, I would welcome any other comments. The bottom line of the answer is exchange of value between multiple participants. With all due respect to a centralized network, it's fine to track and trace maybe on a centralized network, but as we uh, envision and put our goal at, at the exchange of value and not just the visibility of information, this is where blockchain has tremendous importance and I would say the only technology that would manage uh, the exchange of value uh, compared to a, to a centralized uh, platform. Any of the participants, uh, why blockchain? That's a fair question. Why not other solutions? Just jump in. So I think, Chen, for us, um, you know, it's really the idea around the, the immutability and, and the shared trust. Really, when you think about um, that that end use consumer, ultimately, um, that shared trust is important. Yeah, and and any other comments before I, I I take another question because the questions are really really great. Mary, what do you think? I see like your yeah. No, I mean to me, especially supply chains. I mean blockchain technologies. They are uniquely suited to verify, secure, and share data in a multi-party inter-organizational cross-border environment. I mean, to me, this is the ultimate, this is the ultimate use cases for uh, blockchain technologies. Who would you want in charge, right? What centralized market would, who do you want to be in charge of all this? Um, so I think having the distributed power, the shared governance, I mean, the, to me, especially on an end-to-end -end blockchain, I, I can't imagine that you'd want to build this um, in a centralized environment. Yeah, Chen, agree, can, I, and can I just add to that? Of course, it's, it's of course, of course. Completely agree with the, the previous two comments as well as yours, but just, you know, yes, it's true that as an international public sector organization, we might lay claim to being a kind of the intermediary and we might try to uh, do it differently. But I think that ultimately we want this to be a sustainable, um, very sort of um, populated or multi party uh, system that has a, a governance that is very transparent and the immutability and all the rest of it. We want to really create something that is sustainable and not tied to just one organization. Perfect. So, so I, I want to move to the next question because I, I, I read them and, 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 and as we're talking and they're great. So the next question is about how do we go about uh, selling this to clients as most organizations are not uh, are shunning away from being first and, uh, and say, we will be fast followers. So first of all, very true, and a lot of the organizations are fast follow, uh, uh, put themselves in the fast follower category. And I would say we approach this, uh, and I think you see this by, by the panel composition here, this is the answer. It's a combination of academia, organizations like the UNDP who, have the responsibility of creating a better working world and therefore will uh, and are pushing this technology and organizations that commercial organizations that see put on a flag innovation as part of their competitive advantage and and in that regard uh, Bofrost, the uh, uh, Norwegian 
fashion hub and core tev are all organizations that see the ROI in doing this and in moving first as consumer expectations change. Um, Gianluca, Ellen, any thoughts about that? Gianluca. Is, uh, the, for, first of all, I think that we start with the blockchain project with Ernest Young because you have a very good colleague in Italy that convinced me that is a good idea. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, but because for me, uh, we start with this project is more marketing, marketing that we want to show in this, with this technology that with the characteristic of this technology that we, what we said is really true. This is the first point. But uh, when you are a pioneer in one technology, one thing you are, I think that we will take also advantage also for the future, because I think that is, uh, this will be also in the future a big possibility uh, to change also the relation between uh, in all uh, chain, in all the value, value chain of the, in the, the business. And um, for us, it was important because we have uh, one, one million customer and, uh, and in the past was uh, um, now our more old families and uh, we want to, uh, to, uh, to enter in the market for the uh, young person, young. And uh, for this uh, is important to, to, to solve, to, to, get, to give a solution for the need of this and the transparency and the traceability. And these are the really need of this, uh, uh, this new, uh, new potential customer or new customer. Ellen, what are your views on this? Well, uh, first of all, we, as an organization with uh, small and medium-sized uh, fashion brands, we find that collaborating around innovate, uh, innovation and, and project is really important. And by collaborating with EUI, you can also so get the, the top-notch uh, knowledge about the topic, but also share the cost of the project with, between several brands, which means that the investment is lighter on each brand. Uh, and also, lastly, we firmly believe that this will be uh, transforming the fashion industry globally, and we would like to be uh, first movers as the Norwegian fashion industry and, and provide the credibility around sustainable uh, production as we want to, to have. Perfect. So, so I think this is, this is exactly, you know, that the combination of answers is exactly uh, the, the answer to the question. One question that is coming for me, and I'm sorry we don't have time for all, uh, all the excellent questions in the Q&A. Uh, and again, an open question for the few minutes we have left. How do you see the new world coming out of the COVID-19 crisis? affected uh, uh, by uh, or, or affecting uh, track and trace using a blockchain. And really, I, I, I'll do a lightning round, uh, but, but I, I'll, I'll let anyone jump in. How do you see us coming out of COVID-19 uh, with track and trace? Anyone? Can, can I jump first, Chen? Yes. Uh, because I, I do want to say my, my concern about uh, COVID-19 and the global impact, global economic impact is going to be that um, with the closing of, of borders, they were closing off markets and some of these small producers that are producing these goods are having a severe disruption to their uh, livelihood and their you know, ability to sell their produce across borders. And that, that's a huge concern for our, of, of ours. But I would also say at the same time that I do think this trend of sustainability and concern about sustainability on the part of consumers is not going away. And as we build back, I hope that we are building back better and that we're able to put the systems in place that really are assuring more sustainability and again, sharing that value back with those who are producing the, the goods in the field level. Excellent, F fully agree. Uh, last comment as we are out of time. Anyone, how do you see COVID-19 effect? I'll jump in here. Um, at the, uh, one of the things I just wanted to give a shout out to, to, uh, to all of the people around the world that are working on a vaccine. And at the University of Arkansas is playing a role in that and developing predictive analytics based on uh, where is this genome going to be changing. And they need to have blockchain technologies to, uh, to make sure that you're dealing with viable data. And it's also, when did we get this data? 
What is the location of the data? And so we're seeing, we're calling it blockchain explainable artificial intelligence for genome sequencing of COVID-19. That's just one. Simple of name, many. short, simple name. Yeah. Catchy. Yeah. <laughs> but, well, hey, we're academics, but we're just seeing um, blockchains as being solutions that can help us share all of this data that we need globally. I mean, it's the super use case for traceability. First of all, I just want to say thank you to all the panelists from the last four sessions. They have been uh, truly, truly amazing. And so we're, we're up here, we're in the final round. First of all, fresh t-shirts. I have to say it is very hard to find your management and leadership philosophy on a t-shirt. But when you see it, you should go for it, you should buy it, you should wear it. So that is what I'm doing. We're now gonna get into our final round of commentary before our closing keynote with Joe Lubin and John Wolpert. So I'm gonna welcome back our guest stars today Travis, AKA DeFi Dad. We have David Hoffman, the COO of Realty. And of course, I'm Paul Brody, AKA, well, Paul Brody. Um, so uh, let me start with you, Travis. You have had a chance to watch a bunch of amazing presentations. Uh, talk to us about what you've seen and what you think uh, the world of, of uh, blockchain and Ethereum is headed towards. Yeah, I, I think what's really striking to me today is the fact that uh, the ability to build out these solutions is there now. So years ago, we were all talking from a more ivory tower standpoint. We were thinking about what was possible. And, and th that's, that's the thing that keeps me really excited now is, is just realizing that there really is no more waiting. And, and I would encourage everyone that's here as you're listening to this, uh, you know, take that information and share it with your team. Like what, what is the point of sitting on this technology that, again, can save time and money and grant uh, greater accessibility, what's the point of sitting on that? You know, we're all quarantined. We're all frustrated to be inside. And I think for, for those few companies, you know, that have been aggressive in implementing this technology, uh, I'm sure they can attest to the fact that while society has shut down, they've been able to continue onward. Uh, and that's because of the ability to implement these solutions with a blockchain. Um, so there, there was really, yeah, I guess, Paul, actually, let, let's let David uh, give his take on that. I have a few other ideas on it, but I don't want to talk too much here. We'll, we'll yeah, come sorry. back to you then. David, jump in, please. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Now, that was a great answer, Travis. Uh, the, the things I really think about when I think about crypto and, and Ethereum and what, uh, what's coming first is, I mean, first off, it's financial freedom. And that started with Bitcoin, right? Bitcoin is this financial freedom tool. And then with Ethereum, that just takes it to the next step. And so this whole entire technology stack is built on top of that premise, the, the ability to unlock or make free value from its, uh, from its previously locked systems. And when it comes to um, the adoption of these platforms, it's really going to come as a result of, be, of the freedoms that it offers the people that use it, and not just the people, but also the companies. Uh, a smart contract or finance with logic baked in is a very freeing thing. There are a lot of things you can build on Ethereum that allow for capital and value to reach new potentials. Uh, because of the instantiation of code and value in the same place that you can specifically do on Ethereum. And so when I'm hearing these panelists talk, uh, I'm, as a younger guy, I'm a millennial and I'm seeing the people that have gone after problem after problem when it comes to accounting and compliance and, and company to company relations, much more, have much more wisdom and insight than me, really go after the hard problems of how do we go from something extremely simple like being your own bank with Bitcoin to uh, global trustless B2B commerce. And that's, there's a huge chasm between those two things. And I see these, the panelists here today going after that problem. So um, first of all, as somebody who, uh, I'm not a millennial, I just play one on television, but uh, I love that, I love that remark. I do have microphone envy, by the way, that is a nice microphone. Um, give me a sense, maybe we'll start with David since you're already up here. Uh, what do you, which industry, based on all this conversations, finance, supply chain, pharmaceuticals, um, you know, uh, operations, what do you see kind of having the first biggest impact uh, when it comes to kind of public blockchains and, and uh, return on investment? Yeah, so 
in that same vein of unlocking value and unlocking unlocking capital, I think you're going to see the dominoes fall for industries that adopt this new open permissionless blockchain systems based on how much value that industry has locked up. Uh, and, and so I think we can really put real estate really high up in that list. Real estate as an industry is like the, the world's most valuable asset class. It's depending on how you count it, it's between like one third and half of the world's value. And a lot of it is locked. A lot of it is uh, the, the value of a property can't really do much as it uh, just sits and rests in this physical space in the world. So tokenized real estate and then in the combination of token or uh, financial applications on Ethereum, that combination I think is really powerful. And so talking about which industries are going to be uh, impacted first, I think you're going to go down the list of which industry has a lot of value inside of it that is inaccessible because of the limitations of the current financial uh, ecosystem. And what to whatever degree smart contracts and, and code on Ethereum allows for new value to be managed in new ways. I think you're going to go down the line and see those the, the industries that resonate with that the most come on to Ethereum soonest. Excellent. Uh, Travis, your thoughts about who's going to go first and create the most value? Yeah, I, I tend to agree a lot with what David was saying, uh, like keeping it really simple. I, I think that an industry that's going to benefit sooner that already is, is anything to do with procurement supply chain. Uh, I think the examples are, are already there. And I think it was Mary Lassity said, it's just so simple to sell to the C-suite. You know, it's easy to understand how it's important to be able to track your coffee beans or any sort of food where you could potentially lose millions of dollars because uh, you're trying to track down the source of salmonella. So that, that I'd say supply chain is, is sooner. Uh, I, I would say like greater impact probably is financial services. You know, I just go back to thinking about if you think about whether the industry will benefit more or whether the end user will, I'm thinking of financial services because of all of the clients and, and end users. I think like capital moving more efficiently is probably going to continue to eliminate lots of middlemen. It's probably not good for the financial services in terms of their jobs, but I think for the rest of us folks, like we're going to benefit from cheaper money and being able to move money and having like really dynamic uh, financial tools that were traditionally available to those with lots of money. And then I'd say the, the one that's probably the most interesting to me that we didn't, we haven't really talked about today is gaming. Uh, I think that gaming is, uh, I mean, I, I have really young kids, so they're not into gaming yet. And I, I hadn't touched uh, games since maybe high school. And then I got a VR headset recently because of the, the pandemic. And you know, I've, I've just come to discover there, there's like 2.6 billion gamers across the world. Uh, the number keeps growing radically every year. Uh, if you talk to kids who play games about the power of scarce digital assets and tokenization, obviously they don't care about all these buzzwords because they're living it and they're actually using these scarce digital assets. And so the fact that you have gaming that's powered by a blockchain, like that's going to be very transformational for them. And they're just going to continue to use that. And, and that's going to become a norm. And then the other part of that is VR. Uh, I, I think many people still discount the fact that we will, we will in much sooner time live in a VR world. We will work in a VR world. Many of us might have the privilege to meet up with colleagues across the world, work in a virtual space. And, and we'll be able to do that because of the fact that they're powered by blockchains, which enable the ability to build a home, you know, in, in VR. And the fact that you can track scarce digital assets like art, which is already really powerful in the VR world. Uh, so anyways, that's, that's my rant on VR. If you haven't checked it out while you've been in quarantine, I would highly recommend uh, consider Oculus and then also consider uh, crypto voxels which is really interesting because it tracks the authenticity of art inside of its virtual world. And that kind of reminded me of, of um, the last panel as we were talking about um, the Norwegian fashion hub. Yeah, I, I agree with a lot of your points of view. I have to say, I've been seriously contemplating an Xbox and I am terrified of doing so, A, because I might like it a lot and B, because I would have to fight my children for access to it. So um, I want to give a closing uh, opportunity 
for uh, both uh, you and David to have a, a last thought. And in particular, what I'd love for you to do is, you know, we've had this amazing set of discussions today that are all large enterprises. These are all corporate users, and you guys are both deeply embedded in the ecosystem. You're able to see both the business side and the, the broader kind of engineering and, and, and public service ecosystem. Are we heading for some kind of culture clash, or can enterprise companies like EY and Nacha with Fixius and, and the, you know, the University of Arkansas and Bofrost and all of these amazing companies, can they work together in a way that's going to be collaborative, or are we facing a potential kind of culture clash coming up? Uh, David, Maybe we'll start with that. You, I, 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 again, no, we'll I, think back to, uh, I think it's really simple. Uh, at the end of the day, when I used to sell enterprise solutions, uh, it was all about getting everyone on the same page, understanding where they're coming from, connecting the dots to where they might go, and then ultimately showing how do you save time, how do you save money, and how do you create access? And, and at the end of the day, I, I mean, some of this is just becoming so obvious. I get, like, I, you know, I, I don't spend as much time thinking about the enterprise. And so for me today, this has been a really great learning opportunity to catch up on all the excitement. And I mean, I, I've been sitting here just saying, wow, like a year ago, because Paul, you spoke at Ethereal a year ago in New York, and it was a you know really interesting talk, but I mean, there's just so much progress that's happened since then. And so that's why like my, my only takeaway is you don't have to remember all the buzzwords. You don't have to remember all the different protocols. All you need to do is just walk away from this saying, I need to continue to work on this. Like I need to connect the dots and start having those conversations and evangelize this to the rest of my team. Because if you don't do it, no one's going to do it and it's never going to get implemented. So you, you kind of have to be the change that you want. Awesome. Travis, thank you so much for being our guest. Uh, David, uh, final thoughts from you, please. Yeah, so you said, is there going to be a culture clash coming between these enterprises and, and the people? And uh, I, I think it's going to be the opposite. I think we're already seeing the signals of culture clash with the current financial system and the big gargantuan Web2 companies like Google and Facebook and, and their consumers. That culture clash has, has already really arrived. And uh, Ethereum and smart contracts and blockchains are inherently more efficient middleman removing systems. And I think because of that, as a result, companies and their consumers are gonna become actually a lot closer. Because there's fewer middlemen be between a company and its consumers, I think the communication and the comms teams for these companies are actually gonna be able to go directly to the heart of their consumers sooner because, they, because the signal is, doesn't get lost between all the middlemen between these various industries. And so, you know, with blockchains and with Ethereum, there's going to become a lot of consolidation as with, uh, you know, middlemen removing comms efficiency, uh, uh, lots of M&A type stuff, I think, is in the slates over the next 30 years as a result of this technology. And as a result of this technology, products and services go directly into the hands of consumers and not into some intermediary or middleman but before the, the end result. So I think the whole entire chain of systems actually becomes shorter. And as a result, uh, companies and people come closer. And I think that that makes a, a companies like Facebook, who are generally considered not the best when it comes to re, uh, consumer relations, I think are ultimately are forced to be held a lot more accountable uh, because these systems allow for opting out. Um, that's kind of the, the core fundamental ethos of blockchains and cryptocurrencies. And so uh, I, th I think there's going to be a lot more pressure on comms and PR teams in, as a result of this technology.